attention in our lives. And uh, maybe we can, first of all, just quickly reread the, the first two commandments where it says, you shall have no other gods before me. And then sort of following it up, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything um, in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Now, when you look at those, um, those two commandments, um, at, at first glance, the commandment not to have any other gods, to not bow down to idols, that sounds kind of like, yeah, we, we, can, we can probably do that. As the kids ready acknowledged, um, I don't think anybody in this room has any temptation to get down on our knees and, and bow before some, some statue of some type and worship it. We're just not going to do that. Um, in fact, uh, we just don't really see that in our culture at all. And the only time I've ever seen something like, like that happen, and I remember it vividly, was back when I used to live in the New York City area. I took a, a class into New York City to Chinatown one time. And, and uh, while we were in Chinatown, we stepped into a Buddhist shrine. And I remember um, an old lady coming up and right next to us, and she got down on her knees and began to pray to a statue of Buddha. That was actually quite unsettling. It was quite different to see a real live flesh and blood person worshiping an idol as opposed to reading about it in the Bible. But that's, that's unusual. We don't tend to have that kind of thing in our culture. If anything, um, maybe our temptation in our culture is to maybe say, there's no God at all. And I had a message about that just recently. So how do we understand this, this commandment? How do we apply it uh, to ourselves? And uh, it's, it's very, very clear as we examine the scriptures and as we think about this a little bit, that uh, when God talks about not having other gods, when God talks about not having idols in our life, he has much more in mind than, you know, Baal or Asherah or, you know, some other idol like that. There's a passage which uh, we're going to take a peek at here in a minute, which is, which is kind of interesting. Or, and this is just one, one piece out of here. And the context for this, this phrase is a, is a group of Jewish leaders coming to Ezekiel, who was a, a prophet, and they were in Babylon. And these were leaders of Israel. They probably weren't idol worshipers. And they came to um, Ezekiel and said, we'd like you to ask God for some advice on our behalf. And God, in his response to um, Ezekiel, says... Exactly this. He says, these men have set up idols in their hearts. These men have set up idols in their hearts. And so clearly God's um, definition of idol goes much, much deeper and much, much further than actual statues. And so it's worth us asking, you know, what, what is a God? How do we define a God? And... Uh, I'm here to say that everybody has a God, or maybe multiple gods. Atheists have things in their lives which serve as gods. The word God, really, as used in the scripture, is anything that is the most important thing in our life. That foundation in our life, that which gives us hope in our life, that which what we live for, that's our God. And when we start to understand that, then suddenly the commandment to have no other gods in our life becomes very, very relevant. And so we're going to ask here for a little while, you know, what are some of the gods that uh, compete for our attention with the real God? What are the gods that the average Canadian is tempted to serve. And you know what? Even though we're sitting here in, the, in this church, probably almost all of us, if not all of us, call ourselves Christians, and we would say, you know, we don't worship these other gods. You know, we are part of the Canadian culture. And we're very much affected by this world we live in. And so these so-called gods also tempt us. So I'm going to list a few of them. And this list will by no means be exhaustive. 
There is many more that we could put in. I mean, I guess in some ways, uh, the list of possible things we could serve would be endless. But I'm going to list a few here that, um, unfortunately, tragically, dominate some people's lives. And uh, these gods are hollow enough that even the average Canadian understands that this is, this is inappropriate. This, this does not work. And so I'm thinking of things like those folks who live for alcohol, that live for another drink. Clearly, this is a false god. Or people who are into illegal drugs. Obviously, that's empty. Or folks who gamble and who, that's, that's their life. They want to gamble. Um, or even for those folks who are looking for sexual fulfillment in whatever way that they can find that. These sorts of things um, clearly, in the end, don't satisfy. You know, and any God ends up becoming our Lord, and we end up becoming the slave to anything that's a God in our life. And that's very evident with these kinds of things in certain people's lives. I could even add another one to that. You could add, like, food. Um, the Bible actually has a verse somewhere that says, for some people, their God is their stomach. So even something like that, a fascination with eating can become kind of like a God in some people's lives. And even as a, as a teacher of younger kids, I was, I think of video games for especially some young men. Video games, they're huge. I even know a, a young man who, uh, I know him well for, for a season, he was addicted to video games, took over his life. And he finally recognized that and admitted that and, and got some help. Um, but lots of these kinds of things can become gods in our life. And the ones I just listed, it's pretty easy to see that these things, uh, you know, following these kind of gods are not going to lead you to a joyous, you know, life. They're just not going to. But there are other things, other things which are more respectable and which in and of themselves are not, not bad. And video games, by the way, aren't bad either. But there are some other things that are, they're, they're good in their place, but they begin to play a role in some people's lives that are inappropriate. And we also are tempted by these kinds of gods. Sports, for some folks, it's all about sports. Um, they, leave, they live, eat, and drink, you know, whatever it might be. And I think of somebody I heard of once who was a, a very sincere Christian, a very committed Christian. He loved basketball. He was good at it. And uh, it was just a, a huge part of his life. And he just realized one time, you know what? Basketball has become sort of like, like a competing god. And uh, he dealt with it. For two years, um, he didn't play any basketball. He didn't watch basketball games. He just put basketball out of his life until he had reduced its influence to the point where he thought it was healthy to come back in and, and get involved in it again. But things like hobbies of all different kinds, you name it. Um, I happen to like cars, as some of you guys know, and I subscribe to one car magazine, and, and I'm struck by a few of the articles I get in, that I read sometimes that some of the people recognize, they actually have used this phrase, their sickness with their fascination for cars and how they waste time on them. It becomes a god of sorts. Um, even being physically fit for some people can become just too big in their life, too important in their life. Or looking good, um, you know, that can become also something that becomes just, takes over too much of our life, too important for us. Or going to the right schools. I mean, there's nothing wrong with wanting to go to the right schools. If that becomes your life's goal, and that's where you get all your meaning from, then it's become sort of a, sort of a god. Um, or entering some kind of a prestigious profession. Once again, these are good things. We need Christian doctors and professionals of various kinds, but sometimes that becomes the goal of our life, and then it becomes sort of a god. Or having a good income. And once again, we all would like to have adequate incomes, but sometimes money plays a role that it shouldn't. Uh, or cars, talked about that already, or having a nice house. We've got somebody in our neighborhood who's, I think their house is kind of their God. They're always, you know, they, it's perfect. They're always spending time on it and talking about it and want to show you what they've done to it. In some ways, it's be kind of become sort of their God. Um, 
Going on exotic vacations. Once again, it's nice. My wife and I just three weeks ago went on a really nice vacation. It's a good thing. But if we live to travel, then it's become inappropriate or even a comfortable retirement. Lord willing, in the future, I'm going to have a retirement that I can enjoy, but can't live for that. Um, we have to have bigger things in our life than things like, like retirement. So those are all, all different things that, um, yeah, they're not bad. In many ways, they're good, but they can start to play an inappropriate role in our, on our lives. And uh, I think of, of one story in the Bible, one encounter that Jesus had with a person that connects with, with some of these goals I've just listed here. You know, there was that one time when this rich young man came to Jesus. And he was a pretty good guy. He really was. He was not a villain. I mean, he, he said to Jesus, you know, I've, I've kept all the commandments. He'd been respectful to his parents. He, sexually, he was pure. Um, he didn't swear. He was a good guy in, in so many different ways. And yet he understood that there was something lacking. And he, he said to Jesus, what do I have to do to be saved? And Jesus knew his heart. And he put his finger on what was his God. The God that he actually served. Not the God of the Bible that he claimed to serve, but the God that he actually served. And he said to that young man, you know, take all your stuff and sell it. Give it to the poor and then come and follow me. Jesus understood that that young man had a God that wasn't the God of the Bible. It was a God of stuff. And that God had to be gotten rid of. I'm indebted to uh, Tim Keller, who uh, I've, I start to appreciate. He's a Presbyterian pastor in uh, New York City. And uh, he's talked quite a bit about this subject that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about this morning. And he's pointed out that some very good things, some of the best things that this life has to offer, can also become a sort of a God at, at some point in our lives. And he said things like success, you know, success in your career. And of course, that's good. I want to be a good teacher. Each one of you folks want to be successful in whatever you're doing. So it's, it's, it's a good thing. However, if it becomes the dominant thing in our life, if being successful is the thing in our life that comes before everything else, it's become a God. Um, that can't be where we get our meaning from and um, our confidence from. It can't be from our success in our career. And you can see this a little bit sometimes where people have inappropriate priorities because there are people, lots of people, unfortunately, who in their striving to succeed in their career, sacrifice their kids and their family. So it can become kind of a God. Relationships. You know, relationships are good. Um, in fact, when Jesus is asked, what's the most important commandment? He said, number one, love God. But he said, number two, love people. Relationships are good and important, so important. But even there, things can get out of whack. Uh, as Alice and I were traveling uh, three weeks ago, uh, we listened to a novel part of the time, you know, a novel that was on tape, and we listened to it, actually not on tape, on a CD. And we listened to it, and it was a good novel, but it was clear in that novel that um, some of the key characters their life's worth were coming from somebody else, somebody else they had a love relationship with. That other person had become their idol. It's not healthy. And of course, people often disappoint. Family. Family is super important, very valuable. The scriptures say, for instance, in one, one passage which has struck me, that if you or I don't provide for our family, like as a, as, as a, as a dad or a mom, uh, if we don't provide for our family, we're worse than an unbeliever. So families are super, super important. We all understand that. And yet, um, it can't, our love for our family, our commitment to our family can't so dominate our lives that it pushes other good things right out of there. And sometimes our love for our family can even lead to distortion. There are sometimes some, some parents that push their kids to succeed. And they're doing that really, if you look at it, almost for selfish reasons. They somehow get validation through their kids' success. 
So in odd ways, family and caring for family can, can become an idol sometimes. And here the clearest example from the scriptures is Abraham. Abraham. And Abraham had that long-awaited son, Isaac. And that was a tremendous blessing that he had this son, Isaac. But God recognized that Abraham was in danger of making Isaac so important in his life that God was going to be crowded out of the picture. And so most of us know the story where, where God pushed Abraham to make a choice between doing what God asked or to spare his son. And uh, thankfully, Abraham made the right choice. But family can become an idol of sorts. And there's one more that I would never have thought about, so I'm indebted completely to Keller for this one. But he says, you know, even our involvement in good church ministries, our involvement in volunteering, once again, wonderful things, important things, things we should all be doing, they also can become an idol sometimes. And this past week, I was watching a documentary, sort of randomly, on a guy named Ted Williams. I don't know how many people here know who Ted Williams was, but Ted Williams was one of the, probably the greatest hitter in baseball history. One thing I didn't know about Ted Williams is that his mother was very, very involved in the Salvation Army to the point where she completely neglected her family. Her ministry and her, the, the self-worth she got out of it played an inappropriate role in her life. Um, and that can happen if, if our church involvement or our volunteer involvement becomes the thing that gives us all of our meaning, that gives us, makes us proud, that is what people, we want people to think about that when, we, when they think of us, then it starts to become an idol. So I would hope that uh, all of us here understands that this is a temptation for each one of us. Different idols, if you want to call them that, um, are attractive to each of us because we're all unique. But I would hope that each one of us here would want to maybe ask ourselves, you know, what might be this alternative God that's sort of my special temptation? Something that I might be tempted to kind of follow. Something that might push aside the real God in my life. A few ideas about how we might be able to determine that. One way is... If our interest in this other thing, our enjoyment of this other thing, begins to push aside God and his priorities, then that's maybe a clue that this other thing is coming in the place of God. And I tried to think of one example of that. And, and one, of the, one of the things I had never thought of previously as being maybe an idol is family. And I have an example that connects with family. I notice in the scriptures that it says that we're supposed to practice hospitality. We're supposed to have people over and just open our homes up to people from time to time. And you know, if our family plays such a huge role in our lives that all of our sort of discretionary time is spent with family, and we never have time for anyone else, then I would suggest that family is beginning to play the role of an idol in our life. Because it's causing us to neglect something which God has told us to do. A second one, and this is something that Keller pointed out. He says, you know, you can tell that something has become your God if, if you were to think about losing it. If you lost that thing in your life, you lost your job, you lost a person, you lost a relationship. If that thing was taken away, would you be so totally crushed that you would end up in deep despair. He says there's a difference between sorrow and despair. Sorrow is an appropriate response when you lose something good and something precious. Of course there's sorrow, lots of sorrow. But despair, he says, is something deeper. When there's despair, there's no comfort possible. And that's because we've lost the ultimate thing in our life. Another way in this, I heard this from Hank Reinsma. Hank Reinsma used to be a pastor here, but I heard him uh, share this in a message long after he left Grace Church. 
But he had a, he had a sermon on, on, uh, on the first commandment once, and he said, you know, he said, when, when your mind is kind of in neutral, and, uh, you know, you just kind of, you know, you, you, maybe you're waiting in line somewhere, or maybe you're sitting in church and you're bored, who knows what it might be, and your mind's kind of in neutral, where does your mind go to? What do you start thinking about? And he said, that's a pretty good clue about what's really important in your life. What might be sort of an idol in your life. And that's an intriguing thought. Another one be, would be, where do, we, where do we spend our money? What do we spend our money on? Money is precious to us. And so where we spend our money shows our priorities. And it's also been pointed out that uh, strong emotions reveal what's really important in our life. And so when we really get excited about something, or when we really get angry about something, or if we're really worried about something, these kinds of strong emotions tend to reveal what's really, really important in our life. Well, these idols and these gods that we've been referring to here ultimately won't satisfy. They just won't. They never do. They promise, but they never fulfill. You know, sometimes we, we hear about celebrities that end up committing suicide. In fact, there were two well-known people who not long ago uh, did exactly that. And sometimes, well, usually, always, I guess, it's kind of a, it kind of baffles us, especially because some of these people have been so successful. Uh, you know, they have lots of money. They're famous. They're so successful in their career. They're like, they got it all. Why would they ever, you know, commit suicide? Like, that doesn't make any sense. It's been pointed out that sometimes the reason for that is this. The average person has in mind that if, if this happened in their life, like if they had this much money, or if they, be, and if they made it to the NHL, or if they became the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, or whatever, they have some dream. And they think, if I could achieve that, then I'd be truly happy, truly fulfilled. But, of course, for 99.999% of us, we never really achieve those goals. And so we never really find out that they're not what we think they were. But a few people do. A few people become the best in the world at something, or one of the very best in the world at something. They achieve their ultimate goal, and they discover it's hollow. It's hollow. And then there's nothing else. And so sometimes, in desperation, they, don't, they actually take their lives. Beyond that, even the really good things, like relationships, like family, important good things, you know, there is disappointments that come in relationships, that come in families. Unfortunately, tragically, people are fallible. You, you and I can't build our life on people, because people will sometimes disappoint. It's the way it is. Um, and, tragically, sometimes people die. And so our ultimate value, our ultimate fulfillment, always has to be on something deeper than a person, deeper than family, on God himself. As I've thought about this, um, I was thinking of situations where we begin to understand that maybe a little bit more. I've, I've had a, a pretty easy life, really, I would say. Uh, there's no question about it. But, you know, I've, I've been in a couple situations in the last few years where I've, I've had some operations and I've been in a hospital and many of you guys have had something like that or else much more difficult things. But the hospital experience especially, you're laying there in bed, you're hurting, you're uncomfortable, you're worried about what might happen in the future. Um... And especially in the middle of the night, you're there by yourself, right? Your family isn't around, your loved ones aren't around. There you are, alone with your thoughts. And everything is stripped away. You know, when you're facing a health challenge, you don't really care about what kind of a house you live in anymore. You don't really care if a bunch of, if you won the lottery, you shouldn't be paying the lottery anyways, but you wouldn't even care. It doesn't really matter. Um, all those things suddenly become very irrelevant. And even those loved ones in your lives, they really can't help you. They can sympathize with you, 
but they can't really help you. Everything is sort of stripped away. And I found that there's one thing which is still there, and that's God. He's there. Wherever we are, whatever we're experiencing, he's there, and he's faithful. We can count on him. And I, that's why I want to uh, just read, reread this part here from Isaiah, where God says, I'm the first and I'm the last. Apart from me, there is no God. All these other things, ultimately, they, they don't satisfy. They, they can't last. They don't help us in certain situations. Is there any God beside me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. But God is that rock. He's there. We can always count on him. One last topic that I'd like to spend just a few moments on. How can we make God number one? I mean, all of us fall short. How can, how can we make God number one? Well, as I think about that, I think, first of all, we have to believe that God and his ways really will satisfy that God will satisfy. That he will, in fact, fulfill our deepest longings. He will. It's not just something that ministers say and you know, pious people say, but it's actually true. God will fulfill. His ways at the deepest level will satisfy. We have to be convinced that that's true first. And then, of course, we have to make a conscious choice to put God number one. And that conscious choice is going to have to be repeated throughout our lives. And then along with that, you know, how do, how do these other things become idols in our lives? How do we connect with them? Well, we think about them. We focus in on them. We spend time on them. And, uh, and that's how they become and play that, that role in our life that's so important. And I would suggest it's the same with God. If we want God to be the focus of our life, we have to consciously reach out and connect to God. And so I'd like to read this passage here from Colossians, where it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above. You've got to focus in on, on God, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Up there, not at all the other stuff out here. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And put to death, therefore, and it calls this idolatry. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is all forms of idolatry. I think in many ways it comes down to what we sometimes call the spiritual disciplines. We need to zero in on God. That means we need to spend time in his word. Like those maca people are doing, coming together and listening to God's word read for half an hour and then discussing it for half an hour. It means spending time in prayer. It means meditating. It means just exposing ourselves to, to God's truth. That's essential for us to make God number one rather than these other idols that are tempting us to spend time with them. So, gods that are no gods. I, it's been my prayer that this message would be something which uh, helps us to discern what there might be in your life and in my life which is attempting to push God out of the way and that we'd be encouraged to do what we can to push those gods aside and to make God evermore number one. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you for the fact that you are the rock, that we can count on you, that when we're feeling low, very low, when we've lost everything, when we've lost a loved one, when we've lost our health, when we've maybe lost our job, we haven't lost you. You're there. We can count on you. You love us. You still have good things in mind for us. And Lord, we also recognize that uh, there are many things that compete for our loyalty. Lord, uh, give us discernment. And Lord, then give us your grace to be able to say no to the things that we need to say no to and to say yes to you in a deeper and deeper way. Thank you that you love us. 
We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.